the number of the particulate concentration in the atmosphere. So on days when the particulate concentration is high, the number of people who admitted to the hospital is much higher, and the number of people who die is much higher. Also, the long-term lifespan is very significantly affected by the particulate level. And this is very dramatically shown by a paper that just came out this year in PNAS, um, where they, they studied people who lived on opposite sides of this river. And the people on the north bank had lifespans of about five years less than people on the south bank. And what the difference was is on the north bank, the government had installed furnaces. On the south bank, they decided, the government decreed that it was warm enough that the people didn't need furnaces, didn't need heat. And so the people on the south side were freezing, but the people on the north side were living. Uh, I mean, the people on the north side were dying because they were, uh, they, were warm they, weren't, they were very comfortable, comfortable off to the early death. Um, and so this is a very serious thing. And this is actually, uh, I think more people are killed by particulates than killed by automobile accidents, for example. Um, and formation of large carbon species is not only important uh, for astronomy and for its negative impacts on Earth, but actually there's a lot of positive things too. So, um, for example, in industry, uh, large carbon species are used to make tires, used to make inks, uh, probably used to make the black color in the chairs that you're sitting on, um, and the paint is also probably large carbon, carbon molecules. Um, and also, Certain varieties of large carbon molecules are the plastics, uh, for example, some of the plastics in the back there, um, the caps on the uh, coffee cups, coffee boxes, for example. So uh, there's a lot of practical positive uses for them. They also have a, a probably negative effect on the climate um, that the car black carbon um, is, is thought to significantly affect the global warming. Um, and there's a lot of research on going about that right now. Um, now, as we saw in a couple talks this morning, the reaction networks that lead to the large carbon species uh, in the experiments, for example, in Ralph Kaiser's lab, and also um, in, uh, in, in outer space, probably, um, are really complicated. And for sure, in combustion systems, they're really complicated. And so um, you end up with many, many reactions and many species intermediates. And as you saw in some of those plots, you can't even read it. It's so many different reactions and so many different intermediates. The potential surfaces are very complicated. Um, and because of this, uh, we decided not to send a man to do it, but instead send a machine to do the job of keeping track of all these reactions and all these species. And so my group has been working hard on automating the whole process of chemical kinetic modeling. And I think that a lot of this work is probably overlapping with some of the work you guys do. And I think it could be helpful, to, to, at least for us to talk to each other. So my group has designed uh, a software that builds chemical kinetic models, builds reaction mechanisms. Um, it takes uh, numbers from experimental databases. It also has a bunch of rate and thermo estimation procedures based primarily on quantum chemistry. And then it sends the completed model to a numerical simulation solver for, in my case, typically combustion problems, sometimes pyrolysis problems. Um, and um, in an engineering department, we often have an engineer who's sitting there who's trying to, for example, make a new engine, make a new combustor, um, make a new fuel. And they want to see on the computer what's going to happen if they make certain changes. Um, and the software helps them to figure that out rather than doing so many experiments to see all the different possible things that can happen. Um, there's software that already exists that if you have a list of all the reactions and all the rate parameters can it basically construct and integrate the equations um, to predict the time evolution of the system. Um, and so a famous flavor of this is called ChemKin, but there's several other packages too that do this kind of thing. You can also couple with computational fluid dynamics. So in combustion, that's a big deal to be able to get the uh, mixing and the reaction uh, because they happen on comparable time scales. Um, the challenge with this whole traditional approach, this is kind of the popular way to do it, is that somebody has to write down this long list of reactions with all the rate parameters. And usually that's not available. Um, so my group has developed a software called RMG, the Reaction Mechanism Generator, that basically writes these lists. And it writes them based on some uh, well-documented assumptions about how chemicals react. And then this, in turn, is actually coming from reading chemistry articles and textbooks about different functional groups and how they react. And so we try to extract from that and generalize from it to make estimates for all kinds of reactions. And then RMG systematically writes down the, all these estimated rates for all these uh, reactions that might ha happen. 
All right, so there's a lot of challenges if you want to actually make this work and be accurate. First of all, the computer has to identify all the important reactions and all the important species, and hopefully not too many of the unimportant species and reactions, because otherwise the models get completely uh, unmanageably large. Um, so there's an issue here about what is the best algorithmic way to identify all the important stuff as quickly as possible. Um, we have to estimate the numbers, all the uh, important reaction rate coefficients and all the important thermochemistry, for example. And we have to estimate all these numbers to sufficient accuracy. Exactly what's sufficient might not be so clear when you first start to build a simulation. And there's a heck of a lot of reactions. Um, and what we do right now is typically we do quantum chemistry um, on some examples of each type of reaction. And then we generalize using uh, Benson-type methods to extrapolate or, uh, or interpolate between those quantum chemistry calculations. Um, if you're successful at doing this, you'll end up with a very large chemical kinetic model with typically thousands of chemical reactions. Um, then you can run into all kinds of numerical computer problems trying to do stuff with this model. And also human problems. So if you write a very complicated simulation model, it's very difficult for humans to check it. Uh, there's practical things like you send it to a journal. It's too big to fit in the paper. You put in the supporting information, the poor referees, what, how are they going to check? And so there's a sort of a quality control problem, and you certainly have bugs buried in the models. Um, and, and so we try to work on things like automatic debuggers and different ways to chest, check to make sure that there's no mistakes in the simulation. Um, there's a long uh, history, in the, particularly in the combustion field and the pyrolysis field, of people trying to do this. And so if you want to read about it, there's a special issue of comprehensive chemical kinetics was about it. Special issue of advances in chemical engineering was about it, and there's just lots and lots of articles about different aspects of this problem. Um, and I would say that the, the numerical solvers in the 80s, that was the main challenge, was that you could write down the mechanisms, but you couldn't solve them. What's happened since then is that the applied mathemat mathematicians have done a great job, and the software and the computers have gotten a lot better. And so now, typically, you can solve any simulation that you can write down. And we're typically limited by our ability to actually write down accurate simulations with accurate parameters. Um, all right, so the way um, the RMG algorithm works to try to select the species, since that's a very critical thing, is we start out with some little model that has some of the reactions and species that we think are important. And then we have the computer estimate the rates of all these reactions and the thermochemistry. So we have a little kinetic model. Then the computer says, well, what else could these guys do with side reactions? And it does all the side reactions of each of them individually and also reacting with each other. And we make a bunch of species on the edge of this model. And those are all candidate species that you might want to include into the model. And um, so just for example, you might have two species here. You might have propene and you might have HCO as two possible things you could make. It's actually be, typically be a lot more. Um, and then the computer would estimate the rate of formation of these guys because it estimates these rate coefficients. And it solves the model inside the, the cage here uh, to get estimates of the concentrations of these species. And from that, it can estimate how fast these things are formed. And we just do the simple thing, which is the one that's predicted to be formed the quickest, we decide that's the most important, and we stick it in. So for example, here we might decide the propene is being formed the fastest, so therefore we think it should be in there. So we change the model. We kind of grow the model like an amoeba. It eats up the propene and puts it into the model. We now estimate the reaction rates of propene with all these species. And that some of those will form some of these species. Some of them will form new things, for example, allo radical. And now we have allo radical. We still have HCO in the edge. Now we would estimate the rate of formation of these guys, and so on. And we keep doing this approximately 500 more times. And by then, we've added 500 more species to the model. And hopefully by then, the numbers we're calculating that are crossing the boundary are getting smaller and smaller because we put more and more of the fast ones in. And if that's true, then the thing's converging. And eventually, at some point, it converges to some tolerance. And then we say, we're done. And when we're done, we say, well, let's just assume these rates are zero. Erase these guys with our pencil eraser. Shh, shh, shh. Those species don't exist anymore. And the only species that exist in our model are the ones that are left inside. Now, I would say that this is actually not too dissimilar to what humans do when they write down chemical kinetic models. So for example, if you guys have a model for forming of some large carbon species in, in the interstellar medium, somebody wrote down a list of reactions, a list of species. Somebody estimated the thermochemistry of all those species. Somebody estimated the rate coefficients. And somebody also decided, let's not bother to include this wacko species, because I think it doesn't matter. Right? And so this is the computers doing the same sort of thing that a human's doing. This particular algorithm is based on the numbers of quantitatively evaluating the numbers 
for these rate coefficients and, and solving the model, uh, a lot of people, times when people do it, they just do the integration in their head and they say, yeah, it's small. And then they don't bother to write down. Okay. Um, this software is uh, open source and you're welcome to download it and use it. And I think for some of the problems you guys are doing, this might be useful already. Um, the current software is, runs in a serial computer and so it poops out approximately 5,000 reactions inside the core, typically, maybe 500 species. Um, and I have a student working to make it parallel so we can go to much larger sizes. All right. Do you run through all the permutations of the different species? Or? Yeah, we go through all the, um, we have a, a table of reaction types, um, H abstractions, beta scissions, uh, some paracyclic reactions, and there's, I think, approximately 30 total reaction types. And the computer systematically tries every single reaction type on every single molecule in the, in the core and every single pair of molecules. Um, and then writes them all down. And most of them will turn out to be on the edge, and most of them will turn out to have negligible rates. But a few of them will have important rates in the you put in. Did you put error bars in the results? Um, I don't right now, but I have a new student whose thesis project is to do that. So. That's, a hard That's a hard part, yeah. Um, there, the user specifies the temperatures and pressures you want to be at, and they influence when you have to calculate the concentrations of these guys, the concentration profiles of these guys, you have to have a temperature and pressure in order to evaluate the rate coefficients at. And so you'll get completely different models if you put in a different temperature and pressure. We have it right now that it, um, you can type in a list of a lots of temperatures and pressures that you want the model to work for. It'll do one of them first, and then it'll go back, re start with species you found already, and then reassess with different temperature and see if some different species need to be in there. All right. Um, right. So we, we assemble the model for the particular conditions, for example, temperature and pressure that you chose, also the initial concentrations. In your case, it might be low concentrations. <laughs> um, and uh, the computer typically is using relatively rough estimates of the rate coefficients to decide which species to include, because it's typically using Benson-type extrapolations of all the rates. Um, not actual quantum chemistry calculations. What does that mean? Um, so suppose in the past somebody measured methyl reacting with formaldehyde and then uh, somebody did a quantum calculation on some bigger alkyl radical reacting with some aldehyde and the two rate coefficients turned out to be similar. Then Benson would say, okay, all aldehydes react about this fast with alkyl radicals. And so with that, that rule would appear in RMG, in our database of estimate, estimation procedures. And then every single alkyl radical reacting with every single aldehyde would, give it, would be given the same row coefficient. That's not, not accurate. So, but that'll be the first estimate. It'll give you order of magnitude of what the rates are. Then if you do sensitivity analysis, so you do sensitivity after you have this model, and you find out you're sensitive to that number, that number is from nowhere. It's just a guess. And so then we would go and do a quantum chemistry calculation on that specific reaction with a specific alkyl radical, that specific aldehyde. And we might get a different number. Then we'll put the improved number in um, and recompute the entire, we'll iterate the whole procedure. So now, now we've improved that number and the number for aldehydes in general, and all those numbers will, will be improved. So the whole model, which, what we get as a model might be different because it might find out that, that aldehydes are not as important as we thought because of this reaction and therefore something else is relatively more important. And so we would actually build a different model. And then we keep iterating that whole procedure over and over many times until we're not sensitive to any numbers that we think are rough estimates. And this has to do with our estimate of what the error bars are. At that point, we say, okay, we think of a good model. Now we're ready to repeat this whole thing for some different initial conditions. And then we do it for a bunch of initial conditions. When we finally do that, we think, okay, now we have a good model at a lot of different initial conditions. Now we think it's really a good model. And now, uh, now we go and we'll be willing to go compare the experiment. Or astronomy. Well, I guess experiment. Measurement. Observation. All right. Um, I should warn you that you should not expect the model and the data to agree. Um, it, at present, thermochemistry for most species is rarely known better than about a kcal per mole for anything. Um, and the EAs are usually uncertain by at least two kcals per mole for almost every reaction. And the As are often uncertain about, about factors of two, even for things where people have done good measurements. And so there's no way with those kind of error bars you should expect any kinetic model to exactly predict anything. Um, and if you see papers where people publish data points and a line that goes through the data points, that means they got a magic marker out basically and drew it through the data points. It's not anything, it's not a prediction, 
right? It's a post facto. They knew where the points were, so they knew how to make the line. They could adjust their model parameters to make it fit. But it's, um, what, what I'm mostly doing here is trying to predict, um, because typically there won't be enough experimental data to backfit all the parameters in the models. Because I typically have models that have you know, upwards of 1,000 parameters in them. And so it's usually seldom, seldom a good idea to try to model, try to adjust the parameters to match any experiment. Instead, uh, we just, we're just doing the predictions. And uh, um, in, in the design problem where I'm working with the engineers, that's what they want to do. They want to predict some situation that they don't have any data on yet. And try to find ones that look good in the computer, then they'll go and do experiments for those particular cases to try to really nail down what the truth is. Um, I, I, I should just, I can't wish to myself. So I just got a review back from a combustion flame reviewer. You know, he had a paper, had a new fuel, we predicted all kinds of behavior of this fuel. 17 figures with comparisons to the model predictions and some data. And one of them doesn't match. Figure 15. So the reviewer writes, you cannot publish this paper with figure 15. Please delete figure 15. We're like, how does the community learn anything if we pretend that our model is perfect, I mean, the thing you learn about it is we learn that we, we can't predict the conditions of figure 15 correctly, so obviously there's something else, something wrong with our numbers, or we're missing a reaction or something, or maybe there's something wrong with that experiment, but that's where the chance is to learn something. So I was very pleased the editor backed us up and not the reviewer, but I was really shocked the reviewer just said basically what they wanted to do was just delete, delete the figure. Um, anyway. Um, all right, so enthalpies, energies, this is extremely important, I think, for the uh, ast astrochemistry problems. Um, so you're in a situation where you have a, a big molecule and uh, the, the entropy for it to break apart is gigantic, a huge entropy gain. And so there's always going to be some entropy driving the things to fall apart. Um, but the fact that you observe that they grow means the enthalpy must overcome that. And so uh, it's going to be critical that we calculate the enthalpies. In the combustion community, we've learned this already, when we try to model soot formation, we're exquisitely sensitive to the enthalpies of the pHs and some of the larger hydrocarbon species. And if you get those enthalpies wrong, then you get the whole thing wrong. Now, the frightening thing is that a lot of people these days would use DFT, for example, to do enthalpies. And this is a plot of the deviations of enthalpies for the molecules where there's very high accuracy experimental enthalpies. So this is the deviation between the DFT prediction and the experiment. And the scale here is negative 10 to plus 10 kcals per mole on the x-axis. So the DFT deviations, many of them are more than 10 kcals per mole off from the true enthalpies. Um, if you go to a better method, for example, CBSQB3, it costs uh, a couple orders of magnitude, several, several orders of magnitude, more expensive to calculate. But then you can get numbers that are this orange thing here. At least it's sort of centered close to zero. But you still have quite a lot of deviations, and some things are off by about a six or seven kcals per mole, which is still quite a lot for trying to calculate equilibria. Um, if you go to CCSDT F12, which is a really very nice electronic structure method, keeps track of correlation, uh, has explicit, explicitly correlated wave functions, really very good method. You do it with a double zeta basis set, you get numbers here where you're offset from zero, so it's worse than CBSQB3 from that point of view but the width of the distribution is approximately similar to CBSQB3. If you increase the basis set size, triple zeta, quadruple zeta, quadruple zeta including correlations of all the core electrons, you finally get something that looks halfway decent, errors of a couple, maybe two kcals per mole. Um, but the levels of enthalpies that you see in most papers are, are usually calculated CBSQB3 or DFT. This is the most common type methods. And uh, they can be very significantly in error. Now you can save yourself to a large extent with empirical corrections. So these blue curves are after you add empirical corrections to the quantum chemistry calculations. Um, and the typical ones, the ones we're using here, are called bond additivity corrections. Other people use methods that call homodesmic or isodesmic reactions. It's essentially the same thing. If you do any of those methods, you can make even pretty crummy methods like DFT not that bad. And you can make good methods like CBSQB3 or the CCSD you can make the, the errors very, very small, so less than 2 kcals per mole. Um, so you can do very, quite a nice job with this. But this is uh, something to watch out for, is we are making an empirical uh, correction. And if you don't have experiments for any species similar to what you're trying to calculate, you might be really seriously in error. 
Now, we can do that for enthalpies because we have a lot of enthalpy experimental data. So we actually are pretty good shape. For reaction barriers, we're really in trouble um, because we have very few reaction barriers that we really know what they are. And so if you calculate a reaction barrier, you get this black line. And it looks like perfectly reasonable. But then if you look at the enthalpy that, that this method calculated for the alloy radical, the starting, the reactant, you can see that it's almost 5 kcals per mole off. So that gives you some alarm that you think, well, if you're all 5 kcals per mole off in the reactant, you're probably at least 5 kcals per mole uncertain in the transition state as well. You can go to the products, and you can see that um, the products are also you know, maybe 6 kcals per mole off. OK? Um, and you can use the corrections that you use on the reactants of the products to try to figure, extrapolate in to figure out what would happen in the transition state. And you see you get these three different numbers for what the, the energy of the transition state is. And so there's a pretty significant error here. Uh, and also, because these corrections are different sizes for the products and the reactants, you actually get different rates if you compute it in the different directions. They won't really be consistent uh, with the known delta H of reaction. So you have to make some choice about which direction to compute the reaction in, and you'll get something different. It won't really be internally consistent with the quantum chemistry. So you have like a consistency problem. And it's not huge. It's only you know, 1 kcal per mole, 2 kcal per mole. Um, but uh, at the temperatures that you might see in, in, the, in space, uh, that could be a lot. That could be a very big factor in the equilibrium constants. Um, and so I'd say that uh, right now, you would be very lucky if you get a barrier height that's better than 2 kcals per mole All right. from, from a quantum calculation. Some experiments can do better than this, but not much. This is really, this is really, really hitting where you, about where you can do. And these rates that I'm going to show, use and calculate are almost all coming from transition state theory. I hope you guys know about this. Anyway, this is the uh, our CAM formula for it. Um, and the fundamental thing is it depends on a very good definition of a dividing surface between the reactants and the products. And if you change, subtle changes in that dividing surface can, will really change the predicted rate coefficient a lot. Um, there's a bunch of uh, technical problems in the ways people do these calculations. Lots of little factor of two effects. It must work out OK, because actually the rates we calculate in the experiment, they're not that bad. So some of these factors of twos must sort of compensate for each other. But for sure, there's no reason to think that we're doing everything exactly right. I'm going to show at the end of the talk that there's some other ways you can compute the rates. They're usually a lot more expensive and often not any more accurate. So that's why people typically use transition state theory. But uh, there's a lot of people working on trying to make better ways to do the calculations because they recognize the problems. All right. So at this point, you probably said, why am I going to tell you anything about these predictions? I can't calculate any numbers worth a darn. Uh, the model's too big to look at. This doesn't sound very promising. Let's go back in the lab and just measure it. Is that right? Um, and uh, we have a very fortunate thing, is most of the observables we care about are really not that sensitive to any individual rate coefficient or any individual enthalpy number. And so oftentimes the sensitivities are um, sort of square root or less than square root, cube root or something, dependencies on the, on the rate coefficients. So you can have actually quite significant errors in some of these rate coefficients, and they really won't affect the thing you care about. So you can actually get quite good predictions, as I'll show you, even though in every single detail where the model is not really correct. Um, and what's happening here is that oftentimes there's many, many reactions that are too slow to really matter. So I could have put any number in there as long as it's small, and I get the same prediction. Or they're too fast to really matter. I put any number in there for the rate coefficient, and it's always going to come out to be the reaction is partially equilibrated. And so it turns out that I have a big giant model with 5,000 reactions in it. There might be only 20 that are anywhere close to being rate controlling. And the other 4,980, I can have any crap estimate in there at all as long as I'm within a few orders of magnitude. I'm good. That's saving. That's why this whole thing's going to work. Um, but still, don't expect anything better than factor two, because I, I don't think any of my numbers are as good to factor two in the model. All right, now I'm going to show you a test case the Department of Energy funded a ton of experiments on butanol combustion. Butanol is a new fuel. There's a 20 million gallon per year butanol plant was constructed in Minnesota. Um, there's a, a lot of technical reasons why butanol would be better than ethanol. Um, and so it's very attractive. It's so attractive that it's now in the courts as different manufacturers of butanol are duking it out about who owns the key patents to control the production of it, with the consequence that no one can actually buy any butanol right now. Uh, <laughs> so it's not really helping society. But, Hopefully, the lawyers will get it straightened out, and they'll make a deal. And then uh, you'll all have butanol in your car. 
Um, and so because of this, the car makers are really interested to know how butanol burns, and so they wanted a good model for it. So they got a lot of funding to do it. What's really interesting about butanol is that there's four isomers, and they have different octane numbers that vary from 86 all the way up to 100. This is a pretty huge range in how they burn. So they really are very different chemically, even though they look like the same thing. Um, so we built a model. We had RMG consider 30,000 possible chemical species. From that, it selected 372 species as being the most important with uh, 8,700 reactions coupling them together. And we uh, did sensitivity analysis and recomputed all the important rate coefficients with good quantum chemistry. So we think all the important numbers are good. And if you want to read about it, there's a paper in Combustion and Flame. So the model predicts pyrolysis to make butenes very accurately. These are starting from all the different isomers. These are different isomers of butene are formed, and you can see everything is here within maybe 20% of the experimental yields of different butenes. The model also predicts pyrolysis to form uh, more complicated things, toluene, benzene, cyclopentadiene, and you can see the predictions uh, compared to experimental measurements done in, in Belgium are really uh, quite excellent. And again, this is pure prediction, so this is not backfit to the data, this is predicted it, they went and measured it, um, we're, we're really dead on. So this is really pretty good, and the computer discovered a bunch of reactions which I never would have considered as a human trying to write down the model. So for example, this sequence turns out to be very important for making cyclopentadiene, not too obvious to me, but if you fill in all the numbers and all the reactions, it turns out that's an important step. Um, and these experiments are all done about 1,000 Kelvin, you can see 900 to 1,100 Kelvin, which happens to be a convenient time scale for the apparatus they had. Um, we had another collaborators at Stanford had a shock tube, and they wanted to do higher temperatures and shorter times, so they wanted to work at about 1,500 Kelvin, and their time scales are going to be microseconds now instead of seconds. Um, and they asked us to predict the yields of OH and water because they were trying to make laser diagnostics so they could see these guys formed on the microsecond time scale. And so we predicted them with a model we had done before for 1,000 Kelvin. Uh, but then we... Um, uh, redid the sensitivity analysis and saw that at 1467 Kelvin, different reactions are sensitive. So we had to go back and do a bunch of quantum cal calculations for some additional reactions. When we did them, it actually changed the predictions, as, as you would expect, I guess, because you're sensitive to it. And so the OH looks like this, and the water looks like this. These are the, the improved model. This now has the right, all the sensitivities done for that new condition. Now they did the experiment, and that's what they measured, is the OH and the water vapor being formed. Um, from the pyrolysis of butanol. So, um, you know, this, and this is very typical of the kinds of errors and stuff that we, we see in the, in the comparisons. We um, uh, had beam time at the advanced light source, um, and our collaborator Nils Hansen has a very nice apparatus for measuring flames. Um, the one thing about his apparatus, though, is low pressure. So, um, pressure is very important. When you, when you run at low pressure, you really have to worry about chemical activation. So, for example, if you start with this enol, which is one thing that's formed in pretty high yields from butanol, uh, with an H atom, if you're at high pressure, what you'd expect is it would react, and you'd just make these two products, and it would stop. But at low pressure, what happens is it reacts, it forms those products, but they're so energized that they're above the barriers for a bunch of other reactions, and you can make a whole bunch of other products. And uh, so what this means is that uh, you're forming a chemically activated adduct, um, and that adduct can react faster than it gets thermalized by collisions at the pressure you're at. This is going to be the case all the time in astrochemistry, I think, in many cases. Um, so if you're going to do this, now we have to change our algorithm, because we have to keep track of well-skipping reactions that just hop over these wells and fly over to here. So this turns out to be the major product way over here. Um, so originally I had two possible products. But uh, in fact, there's actually 10 products that were observed. Um, and initially, I only had two transition states that I had to compute. But now I have to compute 16 transition states to get this network. Um, and so this is a pain in the butt for a human. Uh, but we automated it. And so the RMG software automatically does this for you. So you just tell it you have these guys reacting. And it'll just tell you all, all 10 products and the, give the rate coefficients for all, these, all the things connected to everything else in that network. Um, and so this is uh, really important because at the, uh, in, in normal combustion, we're sort of in this pressure and temperature range. But in the uh, MBMS flame, we're at a lower, lot lower pressure. And these are um, estimates of where the, you move out of the high pressure limit uh, as a function of temperature and pressure. And you can see that as you move lower in pressure and higher in temperature, you get to be that almost everything gets to be um, 
chemically activated and, and in fall off. And so you really have to compute the pressure dependence. And so you're going to be extreme low pre limits. You're going to be way down here. Probably everything you have to do is computed. And that's very similar to Ralph's experiments where he has basically zero collisions. Um, all right, so this is a check whether the model's good. This is for uh, the butanol flame. And you can see that the model predicts most of the major species pretty well. It also predicts the intermediates. These are a bunch of C2 species intermediates. These are aldehydes and enols. Here's radicals, methyl, allyl, and ethyl. Because of the nice apparatus they have there, they can measure the radicals directly. And you can see that the model predicts all these things very well. Um, we also can predict ignition delays. These are model predictions for ignition delays measured at Stanford for the two different ice, several different isomers. Um, and at conventional conditions, we actually predict um, uh, low temperature ignition delays as well as high temperature ones very accurately. However, um, if you go to a different situation, normally people vary the air to fuel ratio by varying the fuel, holding, doing the whole thing in air. Okay. Um, if you uh, hold the fuel constant and change the oxygen, you actually get a different dependence, and our model does not capture that. So the model's not perfect. Um, this let us discover a bunch of new reaction types. Um, published a nice paper about this in JAX. It explains a bunch of things about low temperature oxidation. Anyway, overall, we can predict the C4 stuff pretty well. Um, and so now we're trying bigger molecules. Right now we're pyrolyzing JP10. Maybe this is more on the scale you guys are care about. At the moment, we're at memory limits, and so we've been fixing the program to, to handle that. Um, so we have uh, many challenges left, like ensuring that we have reliable numbers, handling larger molecules. And I just wanted to emphasize that automation is really helpful for quickly discovering what you don't know. Because um, automation includes everything you do know, and then when it still doesn't match, then it means you don't know something. But at least you skip through uh, all the stuff you know. <laughs> um, uh, so this quickly identifies where, where more work is needed. Now, just make a comment. You might, might want to do this new method. This is a, the transistor theory, as I mentioned, has a bunch of technical problems. And there's an alternative method called ring polymer molecular dynamics, which is a method that avoids the need to define a, a dividing surface. And you can still calculate the rate. Um, and there's a nice free software for it. You guys can download if you want. Um, we've published a ton of papers about this recently to show that it works. Um, so let's apply it to this. This is a reaction that was, I think, uh, interesting to astrochemical people. Um, so this is the reaction of OH with methanol. Gives two different products. This is the measurement. Somebody might draw a magic marker through there and say that must be what's going on, because uh, you expect to be tunneling at low temperature, so you kind of get flat. But actually, um, Shannon and all recently measured it, and they found that actually the rate at low temperature is much higher than it is at high temperature. Um, and uh, presumably, this is due to some kind of tunneling thing, but it would be good to figure out. Um, so this is the kind of problem uh, where you're forming an initial adduct, and maybe the adduct can tunnel. And so you're sort of a lower energy to start with. Um, so uh, this would be a kind of case where you could use that RPMD rate program, and it would be more appropriate than trying to do the tra conventional transition state theory to try to do the calculations. Now, after telling you all this thing, we can make a lot of predictions. As, as Ralph mentioned, we can get up to the second ring, up to naphthalene. I think we understand the chemistry really well, and we can do a really nice job. Above that, things are much less sure, but we can still do a semi-good job for pHs. Above that, we really don't know what we're doing. So experimentally, people have measured soot formation. Soot is formed too fast, um, uh, and nobody knows why it's so fast. And also, you'd expect it to be slow because almost all the reactions, at the temperatures where soot forms, almost all the reactions are equilibrated, so they wouldn't really run in the forward direction. So something is really strange. Um, and uh, also, some people, uh, well, you, if you calculate it, you need, so it would have to be held together by chemical bonds because there's no uh, non-bonding interactions are strong enough to overcome the entropy, the T delta S of separating the particles. However, experimentally, when you capture soot after a flame, you find out it's about 50% liquids. It's called the soluble organic fraction, is in the name in the art. And why, where that comes from, what that's about, and no one knows. Um, so there's a discussion of this. is the invited lecture at the Combustion Institute meeting a couple years ago by Hai Wang, basically highlighting all these contradictions. So I think uh, 
although we understand how pHs are formed pretty well, there's something else happening that makes soot form that we don't know. And uh, it must be very, very fast nucleation because that's why the soot is almost monodisperse. You make uh, all soot particles in a, com in a combustion system almost exactly the same size. So there's something really pretty strange going on. Um, one hypothesis is that maybe the soot, soot themselves are radicals. And in fact, people do electron spin resonance on soot. You'll measure it does have uh, unpaired electrons in it. So maybe those radicals are actually controlling their reactivity. All right. Um, and I'll just finally. So to summarize, um, if you do these kinetic models based on quantum chemistry and estimates, they are predictive for lots and lots of different conditions for small fuels. Um, and you can build these pretty big models pretty quickly. And if you have some experiments to check and some good theoretical guys to help you do the quantum chemistry calculations, you can really identify a lot of discrepancies. Most of them you can resolve. A few of them identify that there's something crucial to learn. Um, and I, I showed how we use it for biofuels. Um, and we're working right now to make it work for more complicated, bigger molecules. Um, and I think this is a really great way to see what's predicted by a current knowledge of chemistry. So for example, if you guys want to understand what our current understanding of pHs would predict, what happened under whatever conditions in, the out in, in outer space, um, I think we could do it. Um, I think that this has to be complemented by some ongoing effort to try to discover new chemistry and improve our understanding, because obviously we don't understand things perfectly. So, um, but I think if we do both of these together, we can really make some good progress. And I just wanted to acknowledge the Department of Energy for most of the funding, all these experimental collaborators who let us see their experiments often before they're published, um, and, and also advise us about the error bars and so on. Um, and then my student, Shamel Merchant, who did all the butanol work, and the RPMD rate program was developed by Yuri Solomonov. Thank you. <laughs>